Despite the progress in the historical performance movement regarding the use of authentic instruments and historically accurate copies, several aspects of standardization might be seen to undermine the purpose of the movement itself. While the most obvious is related to pitch, the choice of instruments has become increasingly homogenized over the years. Concerning the clarinet, the norm since the early 1990s has been to use clarinets by Dresden makers August and Heinrich Grenzer, or replicas thereof, given the numerous original instruments pitched at A430 or thereabouts. However, this does little to acknowledge the various geographic centers of composition from which a great volume of the clarinetist repertoire and many technological innovations can be said to originate, namely Vienna and Paris. While much has been written about Theodor Lotz, few performers make an effort to own additional sets of clarinets from this school of Viennese instrument building that would undoubtedly be better suited to the music of Mozart and Beethoven than the North German instruments of the Grenzers, with demonstrably unique tone production and sound composition. Similarly, few performers on classical flutes, oboes, and bassoons choose to own copies of Viennese instruments in addition to their Grenzer Dresden School copies, and as a result, many wind sections are populated with instruments that might be considered out of place and often of an incorrect time period for the Vienna-centric programs favored by concert promoters. At the same time, replica instrument makers solely offer instruments by the most popular makers, which can at times limit the choices a performer might have in selecting an accurate instrument for a performance, unless the performer were so inclined as to commission a unique copy themselves. Meanwhile, the field of organology contextualizes information from surviving wind instruments, as well as categorized schools of builders relative to the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic eras. It is at this junction of organological scholarship and performance practice that we must evaluate the term accuracy with regards to the historical performance movement in general, and the clarinet specifically. One must ask whether 21st century standardization regarding instrument choice and models to be copied truly represents the music of the past in the way performers think, or whether the practices adopted by makers to allow for efficient modern recreation need to be reevaluated and researched, much like the exhaustive study of performance practice itself. The concept of historic versus historical musical instruments must be addressed as it exposes the conundrum facing replica instrument builders and performers of so-called period instruments. The difference is a matter of extra musical circumstance. The association of said instrument with a musical entity that might add an external credential to the instrument. A historical instrument represents a single example in the context of a larger body of work from a specific maker, whereas a historic instrument exemplifies a builder's work as tied to the performances or writings of an equally well-known musician or composer. The Heinrich Grenzer clarinet belonging to Baron Henrik Crusell would be considered a historic musical artifact by virtue of association with the famed performer and an additional clear lineage in comparison with numerous anonymous Grenzer instruments preserved in collections around the world representative of a larger historical Dresden school of building. Such historical instruments can provide invaluable information about a particular builder's technique and the design of the instrument as a whole. Information from a wealth of surviving playable instruments, each with slightly different dimensions and degrees of hand finishing, can aid in unraveling the thought processes of instrument makers' technique and design ideas over an evolving body of work. By comparison, singular historic examples, for example, Richard Mühlfeld's personal set of Ottensteiner clarinets or Crusell's aforementioned Grenzer, provide insight into a specific performer. In some cases, a close examination of the correspondence between the maker and said player can reveal details about the instrument's role in shaping a particular performer's concept of sound. For example, that between the mining and clarinet section and Ottensteiner, explaining the relatively unusual mouthpieces found in Mühlfeld's case, outliers when compared to other Munich mouthpieces. Such correspondence and physical evidence reveals a player's own reaction to an instrument and provides replica instrument builders and performers with the information to make informed choices when performing the music associated with that particular performer and instrument.
Given this wealth of information, the most effective makers of replica historical instruments heed the example of their performer colleagues and consider as many surviving specimens, often with conflicting dimensions, as possible for each instrument they aim to copy. While some makers, such as Lotz, have left us with a singular example, in the case of many other makers, this examination provides information such as average dimensions, like bore diameter, and likely original reamer dimensions that might bring into focus the original intent of the maker. It is through this study of numerous examples from the same maker that a more complete picture of the original instrument can be attained, which will, of course, ultimately result in a more historically accurate and less singularly historic copy. The following are two case studies undertaken to illustrate the real-world application of extrapolating dimensions and trends in building from singular historic examples. The first, using the heavily modified basset horn by Griesbacher in the Royal College of Music collection, demonstrates the need to consolidate and compare dimensions with other surviving originals. In this case, a privately owned example, as well as one housed in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. While bore dimensions, joint sounding lengths, and several external tone hole measurements correspond across all three instruments, the RCM example displays a much higher degree of undercutting, as well as numerous adjustments to the tone holes of the lowest joint. Similarly, the replacement knee joints of both the RCM and MFA instruments stand in contrast to the original knee joint on the private collection example, which displays the characteristic torqued out design for the C-sharp G-sharp key flap, typical of Viennese makers at the time, if not an original key added by Griesbacher himself. Incorporating dimensions from all three instruments, but based primarily on the RCM instrument, a replica was constructed in 2013, which attempts to peel back the layers of mid-19th century modifications to reveal the bare-bones Viennese character of the instrument itself. The second case study is an exercise in extrapolating dimensions and design elements from a singular example with input based on geographic trends by contemporary makers and supposed pupils. This 2019 project, a newly designed version of the Lotz B-flat clarinet, takes into account the unique bore dimension of the Lotz as compared to almost identical bore measurements of Caspar Tauber's instruments, which proved useful in manipulating the dimensions of the Lotz B-flat in order to arrive at appropriate dimensions for a corresponding A clarinet. Similarly, though not as closely related to Lotz in terms of comparison of B-flat clarinet dimensions, a C clarinet by Griesbacher was used to obtain bore dimensions after which an appropriate sounding length and set of tone hole positions were calculated and designed with acknowledgement of the external attributes and overall design of the Lotz. A similar process was used in 2020 to take the Viennese A clarinet design and extrapolate tone hole positions for a matching Basset clarinet based on the Riga drawing. This process, in which a Viennese trend is deemed as important as the sole surviving original, allows for a degree of imagination in designing a matching set of instruments, while maintaining as many dimensions as possible that could have an overall effect on the sound of the instrument, such as wall thickness, angle of the FC tone hole, and proportional barrel length as compared to the top joint. Such an undertaking shows the importance of a knowledge of structural consistencies and framework that make up a school of instrument makers, allowing the modern day builder to rely on proportional calculations within that framework rather than complete adherence to a non-surviving original. When copying an instrument, it can be enlightening to consider 18th and 19th century sources on the crafts of wood turning, varnishing and staining, and metalwork. Regarding the treatment of wood, 18th century sources provide advice that modern woodwind builders have largely chosen to eschew in favor of speedier curing. There was no single means of seasoning wood in the 18th century among makers and craftsmen. French wood turner and scholar Charles Plumier describes a specific process of saturation and drying. Having partitioned your wood according to the pieces to which you intend, put it in a vessel full of a light detergent made with wood ashes. Bring to a boil for about an hour, then, after having removed the cauldron from the fire, let the washing powder cool without removing the wood, then remove it and dry it in the shade. From a chemistry standpoint, the ash solution creates an osmotic gradient, whereby the water content is higher in the wood upon immersion than in the soap solution. 
water is moved from the wood to the solution in an effort to balance the moisture content between the two, which will be unattainable, in essence dehydrating the wood before the actual drying process has taken place. As a result of this gentle, even process, the wood is more stable and thus less likely to crack, warp, and become unplayable over time. This process of immersion and subsequent drying was a holdover from the Renaissance. Writing in the 15th century, Italian Renaissance scholar, painter, and architect Leon Battista Alberti suggests the following process for seasoning of all types of wood. We have seen our own carpenters immersing timber in water and leaving it covered in mud for a period of 30 days, especially if it is to be used for turning. They say that it will accelerate the curing process and make the wood easier to manage, whatever the intended use. The kiln drying process, favored by many of today's makers, accelerates the process by using a dry heat to force the wood to dehydrate quickly. However, this method can result in an unevenly dried board, which can encourage violent cracking or splitting if not carried out carefully. Though saturating a piece of wood in solution in order to draw out moisture in a slow manner was the most natural way to lower the humidity, the length of time required for this process meant that, in many cases, wood had to be set to dry during the previous generation's lifetime. It is easy to see how such a slow and stable process would be beneficial, at the same time ensuring that the lineage of wood turning would continue after the previous maker's death. This care for raw materials continued well into the 19th century. George Dodd, writing in 1843, describes the seasoning room of the Broadwood Piano Factory. The seasoning room is one which exemplifies the scrupulous care taken in the preparation of the wood before its employment in the manufacture. Every separate piece, after having been exposed to the air for some years, is before final use brought into this room and kept for a long time exposed to a temperature of about 100 degrees, until the fibers are brought to a state of dryness as complete as can be obtained. Early 20th century sources also mention the inherent stability of wood that had been seasoned over time after having been saturated fully in liquid. Paul Hasluck's 1911 manual on woodworking notes the stability and natural beauty of bog oak, wood that had been allowed to naturally age on the forest floor after being cut as a first stage of putrefaction. Regarding the finish of woodwind instruments, there is some divide as to the use of stain to achieve the distinctive colors of clarinets of the 18th and 19th centuries. While some clarinets, such as those by Denner, show no evidence of staining, displaying a lighter shade due to natural darkening of boxwood over time, with coats of linseed oil and exposure to sunlight, other instruments, most notably the basset horns of Lotz and Griesbacher in Vienna, show a characteristic hue only achieved through the use of a staining medium. Such a stain made the wood appear the same color, as if turned from the same part of a tree of boxwood, and in some cases blended two different species of wood together with a unifying color palette. In some mass-produced instruments, the highest quality wood was not used, and such a stain could be cleverly applied to hide flaws and fill imperfections in the wood that might otherwise mar the exterior of the instrument. The method for achieving a unified color on a piece of wood using nitric acid has been known since the 8th century, with numerous treatises providing instructions as to how to achieve such a stain. louis Eloi Bergeron's 1792 Manuel de Tourneur gives instructions on acid staining, including how to alter or darken the color of the wood while the acid is being applied. We take a much bigger earthenware vessel than needed. You can pour aqua fortis into it at will. We will add iron filings into it, little by little. Immediately, blackish vapors will rise, similar to thick smoke. We must avoid breathing them, for they are suffocating and very injurious to the chest. It would even be appropriate to do this operation in open air. Only a little of the filing should be put in at a time, since there is a strong boiling immediately, and the solution, which rises quickly, will escape over the edges. When all the filings have dissolved, the boiling will cease, the solution and even the vessel will be very hot, and they should be allowed to cool before using. Spread some of this solution on the wood, which you can, by putting it in several layers, bring to a very dark brown, and even jasper in places with a brush, any figuring you want. This is how flutes are tinted yellow-brown and bassoons a very dark brown. 
With this information, one can recreate an 18th century stain on a replica instrument, and many makers regularly do so in the 21st century. However, some have in recent years opted for a slightly easier approach to staining, a peroxide-based hair dye which provides roughly the same brilliance of color while being safer to handle. A comparison of the chemical reactions involved in both staining techniques reveals a fundamental difference in the mechanism by which the stain is absorbed. The somewhat volatile chemical reaction of nitric acid with the iron filings when applied to wood caramelizes the sugars in the wood itself, producing a relatively even and deep stain. In the case of hair dye, the peroxide acts as a conduit through which the chemical dye can be absorbed into open pores, but because of the relatively weak chemical structure of hydrogen peroxide and the benign reaction of peroxide with air, the absorption is superficial. Just as a person using hair dye will have to re-dye to maintain the same color with repeated wetting and drying, it is not uncommon to see replica instruments stained with hair dye with a slight dulling of the tint around the finger holes and contact point for the thumb, indicating the impermanence of this modern adaptation. In addition, the caramelizing effect of the acid stain on the wood has structural benefits when it comes to instrument longevity. By polymerizing the oil absorbed into the instrument, the acid seals the outer wall of the wood from the elements. Such a process, combined with multiple coats of linseed oil as a finishing medium in the bore, offsets some damage due to absorption of saliva and water. By comparison, peroxide acts in the opposite manner, as the oxidation opens up the pores of the wood, allowing fast absorption of dyeing agents but failing to reseal the pores, resulting in a piece of wood that is sterile, dry, and exposed to changes in humidity and temperature, requiring considerably more oiling after staining to stabilize the wood. Given the difference in chemical mechanisms of the two primary methods of staining, it would seem that acid, while more complicated, results in a clearer, more uniform stain and a more protected piece of wood. Maintenance for clarinets changed little in the 19th century, even as the addition of keywork and novel methods of mounting keys meant that boxwood was becoming an increasingly less suitable wood for reasons of stability. The pair of acid-stained Ottensteiner instruments belonging to Mühlfeld, as noted by German builder Jochen Segelke, have been submerged in linseed oil and allowed to dry without the oil being wiped off, which mirrors instructions to players in early 19th century treatises. Such a method of caring for instruments stands in stark contrast to those used by some modern makers who seal the bores of their copies with a marine epoxy or shellac so that moisture has almost no effect on the wood at all. Similarly, some modern makers have been noted to temper their linseed oil with superglue to accelerate the drying time of the oil, which in essence turns the oil into a hard plastic. With an increased demand for instruments, it is no wonder that makers seek ways to accelerate production, particularly in the finishing stages of their instruments, though to various extents at the potential expense of historical accuracy and playing experience. The above observations on the different manners of production of musical instruments in the 18th century, as compared to those of the present day, show a paradoxic tendency to slavishly copy select historic examples to a degree of accuracy not present in the 18th or 19th century, while at the same time overlooking certain aspects of historical building practices, such as treatment of the wood itself in the name of expediency. Referring to historical plucked instruments, William Sampson laments that makers of the late 1970s often were and continue to be more concerned with appearance than sound. I believe that the early instrument business would be healthier if makers spent rather less time on appearance and decoration and rather more on acoustical considerations. This might even result in a new living tradition of early instrument making on a more business-like basis rather than the precious approach, that is, making expensive pieces of reproduction furniture copied down to the last wormhole. This critique of instrument makers of the 70s could just as easily apply to the historical performance movement in general. Even in the present day, the desire to appear visually correct often overshadows actual historical performing practices. Too often, clarinetists rely on plastic or ebonite mouthpieces rather than the wooden ones well known to be in use, and in some orchestras, it is a common sight to see a modern metal ligature or a flexible rubber one used in place of the 18th century string. 
While some of these players in the 1980s who accepted such compromises have since adopted a more historically informed approach, many were and continue to be modern performers who interpret the historical performance movement as a primarily visual rather than philosophically different approach to making music. Colin Lawson notes a wide range of fidelity to the historical original in the United Kingdom, which mirrors trends on the European continent and in North America as well. UK period clarinetists have each quickly established an individual position on a spectrum ranging from historical fidelity to practical expediency. Some players have had a genuine love of old instruments, while others have wanted to get as close as possible to the aesthetic of modern instruments, disguised in boxwood. Clarinet replicas, with their tweaked mouthpieces and sometimes over-generous mechanisms, have come in for some tart criticisms from organologists, who have felt that even the demands of air travel and the microphone can scarcely justify such cutting of historical corners. To justify all of this, one might argue that the 18th century did not have to grapple with air travel or the microphone. The above being said, one must acknowledge that the business aspect of the historical performance movement was previously fueled by the recording industry, calling for compelling, historically informed, yet easily marketable recordings. As a result of the expediency demanded of performers, many rely on instruments which, like their modern counterparts, are easily played, adaptable for any type of period recording, regardless of geographic locale, and familiar to the fingers and embouchures in order to fulfill the expectations of auditory perfection and minimal need for editing. Such compromises on the part of performers, while understandable, are lamentable and seek to undermine the intent of the historical performance movement, as Baroque violinist and pedagogue Stanley Ritchie has noted with regard to the increase in string players with sudden monetary interest in period instrument performance. Some musicians, who, having previously derided the concept and mocked the pioneers of historical performance practice, now perceived that there was money to be made, and jumped aboard without paying the fare. In the cynical spirit of derision, they decided that all they needed to do in order to qualify as a Baroque, or later classical, musician was borrow the necessary equipment. One potentially successful enterprise foundered because such players were hired by a misguided organizer. With regards to performers who opt to purchase their own copies of historical clarinets, similar compromises are being made on the part of the very people such performers depend on, the builders of the instruments themselves. Attempts to modernize the production of historical instruments undermine the aim of the movement to some extent. However, an overly dogmatic approach to copying existing historic clarinets, often inadvertently recreating the flaws or ravages of time on a particular example, can also lead to a less than accurate representation of how an instrument might have originally performed in the 18th and 19th centuries. It is ultimately up to the individual maker to decide which facets of an instrument should be reproduced and which should be researched compared with other representative instruments and calculated. With the vast amounts of information in both published measurements and museum collections, such an informed 21st century approach to instrument building is perhaps a step in the right direction towards approaching a more rigorously researched 18th century sound.